Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Ignition Community Live. We are in the Leveraging Ignition for Smart Manufacturing and Digital Transformation. And this is today's topic, uh, which is how Grand Tech is leveraging ignition for smart manufacturing and digital transformation. And things about, uh, you know, some of our communication that we have uh, with other folks too, and some of the trends at large that inductive automation is seeing in addition to the trends that Grand Tech is seeing. So as more manufacturers are tasked with designing smart manufacturing and digital transformation, two, two buzzwords, right? What do those really mean? Where do you go from there? Let's define it, let's talk through, let's understand where to start here, um, and let's get information from Grand Tech about all of that. So Sam, I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about all of this. Sam, I think that I will turn it over to you and then we'll just go back and forth from here, so. No problem, that all sounds great. Thanks for that intro, Kevin. Uh, one thing that I think that Kevin mentioned that is uh, that I definitely latch onto a lot as we talk about this space is that smart manufacturing and digital transformation just as buzzwords. They are big concepts that are out there and they could really cover a lot. So actually where we're gonna be starting is uh, working to define those a little bit more clearly. So we're gonna define smart manufacturing and digital transformation and how those two ideas relate to each other. Uh, then we're gonna get into our main contact and talk, uh, sorry, content and talk more about Grand Tech and how we have been leveraging and how our customers have been leveraging a condition for their smart manufacturing initiatives. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can use Ignition specifically as a starting point and some of the low-hanging fruits and foundations that you can make to have that be your platform of choice that drives you to smart manufacturing and digital transformation. And then we'll open it up for a little bit more questions at the end. A number of folks take a look at smart manufacturing and digital transformation, the, those two phrases here. Uh, and it can mean different things to different people. It sounds like you're going to go through and let us know what that means to uh, to you personally and to Grand Tech too, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So actually I start with uh, the kind of the industry definitions that, that I personally like the best uh, because boy, are there a lot of different definitions out there <laughs> for a lot of these terms. Uh, but yeah, it's all about um, kind of taking that core concept out of them and figuring out how it applies to you and your business and how you're going to improve out of it, right? So for example, um, first we'll talk about kind of what is digital transformation and Gartner actually has a definition that I like a lot around it, digital transformation referring to any type of IT modernization, for example, cloud computing to digital optimization to the invention of new digital business models. And I find that idea around new digital business models to be interesting and it covers a lot of ground, right? So it's not just the technology in that optimization part, but it's also around changes that could be affecting personnel or organizational structures or process. And it's really not specific to manufacturing when it's just phrases digital transformation, right? Banks invest huge sums of money in business uh, in digital transformation, as do law firms, as do hospitals. So uh, a lot of the ideas of digital transformation certainly apply to smart manufacturing, but they are not as industry specific as some other terms like smart manufacturing are. So you can really think of smart manufacturing as a subset of your digital transformation, right? So digital transformation is the broad term that covers and focuses on the entire business where smart manufacturing is more directly related to manufacturing and the supply chain. Um, so building things in smart manufacturing when you're doing it the right way, when you're doing it strategically, all contributes to your digital transformation of your company as a whole. But if you are looking for keywords and you're looking for things specifically about how to make a smart factory, the term smart manufacturing is more likely to guide you in, into the technologies that are going to be looking at that type of application. So a lot of folks talk about their digital transformation journey. Uh, what they have to uh, go down, the things that they have to do. Would you say that smart manufacturing is an important part or an important step inside that digital transformation journey? Maybe even the first step? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's for, especially for those where manufacturing is a critical component of, of their business process, right? Um, but again, it kind of lends into this idea that what smart manufacturing means 
can really change based on what your business is doing. Um, high customization is a great example of that, right? So for uh, a lot of companies now are adapting to a business model where they are tailoring their products and solutions to specific end users, focusing on small batches, things like that. That's gonna work for some companies and be where they really wanna grow, but it might not be for others. And both could lead to digital transformation initiatives, but the way that that impacts your manufacturing process could change significantly based on where you wanna get. Cool, so um, now that we've talked a bit about digital transformation and smart manufacturing, let's define smart manufacturing a bit more, right? So for this, I like to use the Mesa International definition. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, Mesa is the Manufacturing Enterprise Solutions Association. They're a global nonprofit. They focus on education and standards and best practices for more smart manufacturing specifically. Uh, I highly recommend their uh, website, mesa.org, if uh, that is a new term for you. Uh, and they define smart manufacturing as the intelligent real-time orchestration and optimization of business, physical, and digital processes within factories across the entire value chain, uh, talking about how resources and processes are automated and integrated and monitored and continuously evaluated based on all of the available information and as close to real time as possible. So while I like that definition, uh, I like it because it covers a lot of ground. It talks about the entire value chain. It talks about information delivery. There's a lot of words in there too. So I oftentimes distill it just down to the acknowledgement that we are using an unprecedented amount of access to manufacturing and business data to drive more informed decision making, right? So we have this new mm -hmm. connectivity to plant four systems, we have new connectivity to business systems and ERP, and the way that you use that information to drive context and bring people to make informed decisions uh, is really the goal of what we're trying to get out with a lot of these smart manufacturing initiatives. And a lot of that actually kind of um, is encapsulated in this concept around closed loop manufacturing, right? So um, if you're not familiar, this is the general idea of taking that manufacturing and business data and um, starting to use it in these iteration cycles to improve process. So a lot of the things on here you might have in use today, in fact, you probably do. The basic ideas of this are captured in something like just alarming and fault detection uh, within a system, right? Where you have your manufacturing process on the left that's actually making your uh, finished goods, you capture data from that, you add context to that data to turn it into information, um, and then you deliver that information to an end user. So that could be a temperature sensor being your data, using the limits of that sensor and the probe um, that you expect as your information, using that to drive an alarm and delivering that to an operator to have them take some type of corrective action, right? So just in that is, is really closed loop manufacturing. Where smart manufacturing makes it a little bit different is the different number of inputs that we have and the different number of outputs and audiences that we are able to deliver that content to, right? So now, as we are taking our data from the manufacturing floor and turning that into information, we have can bring in information from business logic or master data or predictive models and use all of that to help us calculate that information. And once we have that, it's not necessarily just the manufacturing process that we're informing, right? Those same types of results could be of interest to your grander supply chain, to data scientists, to your product teams, or to machine uh, learning platforms. But you have a lot more places that you can deliver this to improve your business overall and the insights that you can drive from it. One thing I think is, is really interesting about this picture uh, that you're creating here and you, you tell me if this is true from your perspective but the closed loop manufacturing where you're you're going through and you're you're feeding this information it's not just going in one direction or it's not just you know some control on the plant floor it's actually coming back around to it you'd mentioned alarms as an example um but are you seeing an increase in closed loop manufacturing from uh, things that uh, you have on the right there, so predictive models, AI machine learning platforms, other things that might be analyzing this data, and then maybe even feeding back into the process in a way that it's going to, um, rather than just informing the user that there's there's something, maybe it, it takes part in the control in some way, tunes set points, or um, mm -hmm. adjusts different things, or or, or gives information that is graphs and charts and other things that uh, operators might be able to respond to directly right there based on some predictions. 
Yeah, for sure. So I, I think the answer is a little bit of both. I mean, it is something that we are seeing and it's something that we're seeing more often. Um, if it's in its infancy or not, really kind of depends on the, the industry you're in. Um, a lot of the ideas of smart manufacturing for, for some industries are uh, have been in practice for a very long time because that's they've had a high value proposition to them. So you had to adopt it to stay competitive. Whereas this is new information to to other industries. And what we also find is that learnings from one industry or vertical are starting to affect others as well, right? So where um, golden batch ideas may have been very important um, and a priority in food and beverage, um, those are kind of moving over to other processes and industries where maybe that concept is is valuable, but didn't have the return to justify the cost of experimenting like it did in that primary industry, right? The other thing that you mm -hmm. mentioned there that I definitely think is true is that this is just one loop that is going on around the manufacturing piece of it. But what you'll see sometimes and what I actually show in one of our case studies towards the end here is that there are other loops between these systems that happen externally from your manufacturing loop as well. So we're going to show an example later where this loop brings manufacturing data into information processing systems. But then we circle it back out again through advanced analytics platforms and golden batches and predictive models external to the manufacturing loop to inform the next generation of data that goes into it. So absolutely, yes, as this as we get more data sources and destinations, there are other processes that are taking place external to this that inform the overall manufacturing model. I'm excited to see what you have to show later. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, so with, with all of this, of course, around your process, your capture, your processing and your delivery, Ignition is a very good platform to kind of help you sit at the center of all of this, especially in that manufacturing space, right? So when we do start to get things outside of the plant, if we're talking about some of those other loops, right, there might be other tools that are the best fit for that. But when we're talking about taking data from your OT devices and starting to use that and drive action, Ignition is a great platform to get started. Now, I'll also briefly mention that we, I am going to summarize that model into a make, collect, process, and deliver keyword. And I'm just saying that because you'll see in the upper right corner of some of my slides later, I'll just kind of follow this along so, so you can see where I am in the process sometimes. But this is just a summary of the same cycle we just saw. And speaking of moving along, let's start talking about more how Grantech and our customers have been leveraging Ignition for smart manufacturing. So earlier, I broke down the data that we need to collect into manufacturing data and business data. And I'm going to start with the manufacturing side and talk about what we're seeing people do with Ignition to collect their manufacturing data. So one of the most common early stumbling blocks that we see in smart manufacturing is just simply getting the data that you need. Um, and a lot of times when I do start to talk to customers and one of the one of their pain points is that they don't have all of the data to drive smart manufacturing, I often think of Ignition as the, the glue that can bring a lot of that together. So a lot of it's pretty, you know, relatively common standards, things like direct built-in driver communications to modern PLCs like the Rockwell and Siemens suites or um, OPC servers and other more specific drivers to address specific other communication issues. But then we start to move into some of the things that are more unique to have built directly into the Ignition platform. Uh, the SQL Bridge is a really good example of that, being able to do built-in integration to databases as opposed to just OT devices is very powerful. Um, Ignition Edge is a great solution to help integrate islands of automation, especially so if you have things that are not connected to the Ethernet network or not able to, but the cost of upgrading them is too expensive. Ignition Edge is a really great solution for things like that. And then we also have things like MQTT with the Cirrus Link partner modules that help support low bandwidth and remote applications. So not only that, but once you have all of those information gathering techniques, you will now have the power of having this data in ignition and you get a lot of the power of ignition to realize immediate gains from this right so one of the one of the tenants that i oftentimes advertise is the idea that ignition can act as your central data hub and use that built-in opc ua server to provide to be that single source of truth for your manufacturing data and distribute that information to other platforms and systems as necessary one of the other things, actually, my personal just favorite thing that Ignition has built in out of the box 
is that mm -hmm. historian right there um, in the tag designer where you just click on a box and start to collect historical data. Um, there was definitely a long time that that was not a native feature in a lot of platforms out there. And every smart manufacturing project I have ever been involved in relies on historical data to some extent or another. So having that so native to the platform, I think is really powerful in enabling people to start to leverage historical data. Kevin, were you jumping in there too? Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, I was actually going to ask you a couple of questions here. So uh, you're obviously very familiar with Ignition, and um, you're talking a lot about manufacturing. Can you give us just a quick overview? I realized that we didn't do this. A, a quick overview of who Grand Tech is and what industries uh, that Grand Tech is in. So when you're speaking from all of your experience, and you have a lot of experience. Um, what industries are is that experience coming from, and uh, where does this? Where do you really see all of this applying? I know that's uh, several questions all in one, um, but I think that that would be pretty interesting to talk about for a minute. Yeah, no worries. Um, I do have kind of the the more grand tech pitch. This is who we are at the very end, but the the quick preview of that would be. Uh, so yes, as, as Kevin mentioned, we are a, a premier systems integrator. Um, that works a lot with the Ignition platform. Uh, we're based in North America, so we have offices across the U.S. and Canada, um, around 200 employees strong um, across those two regions. Sorry, we have offices out in India as well. Um, and yeah, so we are a, an integrator. We work from mostly in level one through level three. So from the uh, automation devices and processes through control systems and automation through MES systems and smart manufacturing systems like this. So um, I personally am the director of smart manufacturing over at Grand Tech. So my job is to advise our customers and our company on the direction they should be taking as they do embark on smart manufacturing initiatives, whether that be finding out the requirements that are going to drive the justifications to invest in smart manufacturing through finding the right vendors and tools to solve a specific problem through just general consultation on what to start to do with this data once you all have it across a large enterprise plan. So uh, Grand Tech's two main uh, verticals are food and beverage CPG and life sciences. So we do uh, touch on a lot of different uh, industries in our experience. And one of the things that we have found interesting is that when it does come to the smart manufacturing space, things do start to become more industry agnostic. And we have found um, people from various uh, industrial backgrounds um, are able to kind of abstract out some of the details of the process and talk to us about smart manufacturing across various verticals um, in manufacturing. So I uh, hope that gives a little bit of context. A uh, very good question, Kevin. Thanks for giving me a little bit of pitch time. <laughs> sure, sure, and I, I I don't really even see it as pitch time, right? It's uh, you know, this is, these meetings aren't really about pitching. Of course, yeah, you're gonna put yourself out there, and you know, folks will latch on to that. But um, but I think that having that background and knowing where you're coming from and what your uh, what the background of Grand Tech is and what your background is uh, probably would help the attendees. Um, I'll be able to frame this a little bit. And I think being the size of uh, your company that it is that you just mentioned, uh, you're, although you have a couple of verticals that you focus on, that's not, that's not the only thing that you do. Um, and there's, uh, there's a wealth of experience. Uh, there's quite a few engineers I've talked to from Grand Tech who um, could talk all day about all sorts of different industries that that they're coming from and that they have background in. And, and I know that Grand Tech is a very uh, sharing company that uh, brings together a lot of the skill sets of different folks who um, are coming in and uh, brings that all to the table. So, uh, so great. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding uh, pharma um, and you've got food and dev, consumer package, good CPG um, for those who don't know the acronym. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that covers, the, there are so many things that are so similar for general manufacturing and automotive. And, you know, when you get to the point of just data collection, data analysis, data, um, circling that back, that definitely, in my experience, a lot of this stuff just applies straight across the board for, for everything that's manufacturing. Um, yeah. Sam, I didn't mean to uh, derail you here, though. I know you have a... Uh, uh, focus on the way that you're crafting 
um, the message and sharing this information. So back over to you. No, 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 no problem at all. Uh, again, I'm happy to share. Uh, but yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that you said. Um, I used to, to joke when we were interviewing new candidates that it's all the job is all about taking the lessons learned you made from making cookies and biscuits yesterday over to the, the wind farm you're going to be working at tomorrow, right? So absolutely, a lot of different verticals. And it's all, and there, there are core similar concepts across a lot of them. And we try to really bridge that gap for a lot of our customers. And hopefully you're bringing some of those cookies and biscuits to the wind farm when you go there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> okay, great. So we talked a little bit there about Grand Tech, but just before that, we were talking about um, admissions connectivity um, and the way that it can bring in data from a lot of different types of OT devices in a lot of different environments. Um, just quickly, I do have kind of a simple and a more complex architecture to show um, just some high level of how Ignition can help you with that connectivity. So one of the things that we had mentioned was using Ignition Edge to help with legacy devices and islands of automation. So in uh, there's a lot of different versions of the Edge solution out there right now to help you pick and choose the right one for uh, the given use case that you have. And, and this is a simpler one where I like to always think of this as using that ignition edge as a connection to some other island of automation or something that couldn't go on to the, the ethernet network itself. So we're using ignition edge with some type of serial connection or other type of communication to speak with that PLC, though it could be over ethernet as well if you needed it to. And it's able to, to act as that local buffer and that single point to, to represent the area that you're in and it can store and forward that information over the internet or uh, your plant network to a central ignition gateway or for processing consolidation. So just a good example of a way that's for what is a common and can lead to a complex problem of having non-Ethernet enabled devices that might be very expensive to upgrade. Here within the platform, we have a solution ready to go to start to address some of that. One other more complex architecture we also show is more around um, collecting things using a combination of Ignition Edge and something like MQTT for both accessing remote devices and some business applications, again, all managing that through a central gateway. So this would be more suitable uh, for controlling a remote site where bandwidth might be a concern um, and where you do have business applications that are able to communicate with you over MQTC. Um, Kevin, is there any other thoughts that you have around Ignition Edge and, and where that's a good fit for, for collecting data? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if we're if we're talking at a basic level, um, MQTT, in addition to the remote data collection, we do see some folks doing that where they need reliable data collection on the plant floor too, uh, where there's an individual island of automation, maybe an unreliable network, maybe Wi-Fi even, um, and they're looking for some store forward from there, um, or if they have a corporate standard where they're trying to make the data as accessible as possible and need a single source of truth. Those are the two additional things that I've seen this a lot. And in addition to the remote data collection, yeah, lots of folks in oil and gas and water, wastewater are using it where they, you know, where it just makes sense for bandwidth savings and uh, remote uh, collection, unlocking that data that's on the remote, changing your polling times from, you know, three minutes or one minute to uh, getting it over nearly instantly, normally less than a second for values to come through from changes from the edge um, and often just milliseconds. Um, so it's, uh, but yeah, in addition to that, we've seen a number of folks who are, who are going on that side and this doesn't really depict it, but uh, MQTT sometimes cross facility where uh, we've got some bigger companies that have uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 locations that are sending all of their plant information out over MQTT to a central location uh, so that all their business systems can just tie into the plant tags. Um, and those can be accessible with, uh, you know, tens of thousands uh, of tag changes per second streaming over it. It's such an efficient protocol that uh, that's, that's fine, that, uh, you know, you can get lots and lots of, you know, millions of tags going through these systems without uh, break in a sweat in a lot of cases. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. So um, to kind of continue on, so we talked about, and especially with this architecture I have on screen now, um, the way that you would use MQTT to potentially bring in data from other business systems. Though 
not all of your business systems are going to be MQTT enabled today. So what other options do we have to start to collect some of that business data? And what better uh, system, what better module to connect to business systems than the business connector module? So the business connector is a partner module made by Cepasoft to accelerate connectivity to ERP systems. So in addition to the business connector itself, there is also the SAP, uh, the interface for SAP ERP that can sit on top of that to help accelerate SAP integration specifically. Um, so the business connector can help you accelerate non-SAP integrations without the SAP interface. But if you are working with SAP, um, you should definitely look at the interface connector to see if that's going to accelerate your process and save even more time and effort. Um, and one of the, the very powerful things about that business connector module is that it lets you spend less time in code and more time in easily understandable graphical interfaces to help you develop those connections, right? So we're using more function charts and auto-populated mapping tables to help you associate data from your ERP system into the context of your ignition tags and your ignition structure and MES. So without those connectors, um, you can still absolutely connect to your business systems, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit on the next slide, but um, if you are able to take advantage of the business connector and the interface for SAP. Those are built-in accelerators that should speed up your development process. But they're not the only way. So we do have other solutions uh, within the Ignition platform that can facilitate communications to business systems that are uh, non ER, sorry, that are both non-ERP or ERP solutions. So that can include the SQL bridge to exchange data through database tables. It could be the Cepasoft web services module to do custom uh, coding to bring in information from uh, business system platforms or using some of the industrial protocols like OPC UA uh, when that's available as well. So these are going to vary more depending on that business system that you want to interface to, but that's also where the flexibility of Ignition can come in and be very powerful is that you have a lot of different options for integrating to those systems. It's just a matter of understanding the value, understanding that interface, and making sure that uh, we're, we're quantifying and picking the right tools to, to do that type of uh, interactivity. So, so we've talked a lot about kind of our data collection options. Let's move on. Let's go to the next part of that cycle now, uh, more about the processing. So remember, information is the idea of data with context to it to make it actionable, right? So data is just your raw ones and zeros and numbers. Uh, fairly useless on its own without context from anything as simple as engineering units and scaling all the way up through process order context and full business logic around a specific piece of data, right? So let's talk about within Ignition, the tools that you have to add some of that intelligence into the data that you are collecting to turn that into something more actionable. One of the, the low hanging fruits around this is just to, to utilize the tag calculations or light scripting that you have available within the Ignition platform to help you calculate KPIs and other critical control points that are in your process. And the fact that you have access to those multiple data sources, both OT data sources and business data sources, manual inputs, things like that, makes Ignition uniquely suited to kind of be the, the central point for combining that data and presenting those KPIs that you have. There's also the ad hoc analysis tools that come with the product as well, right? Things like your, your trending or creating clever screens that show the, the information at a glance that you need. Remember that digital transformation is a journey and that of course we want to digitize as much of these processes as we can and we want the, the computers to do a lot of the hard work for us, but especially in the meantime, and when we're getting to more complex problems, that, that human touch can still give a lot to the process. So just giving the right information to, the, the right data, I'm sorry, to a qualified individual to help derive some of those insights manually with the right tools can be a great step in the journey towards smart manufacturing and digital transformation. And finally, um, just to acknowledge kind of like what I was saying earlier, there is just some intelligence and smartness and a lot of the processes that we're used to doing today, um, things like alarms, things like high performance screens, things that give you the contextualized reported information that you need at the right time, 
but a lot of times these can also use a bit of a refresh, right? A little bit of a re-examination to understand how clear that information is to make sure that it does make it to the right people. Uh, you know, we've all walked into that situation where we see an alarm banner that has a hundred unacknowledged alarms that are all flashing. And when you ask someone about it, they say, oh, well, we never actually pay attention to that. That screen's always that way. Uh, of course, that's something that we want to move away from. And by just taking the tools that we might have in place today and from a SCADA perspective and tuning those and reevaluating them to make sure that they are delivering the contents that you need, it can actually be really powerful. We now, have a couple of questions that came in. So oh, there we uh, go. The first one, actually, if you bounce right back to the previous question or the previous slide, um, sure. the question is about that. How is the CEPASoft web services module different from the web dev module or the web development module? Uh, and that is a fantastic question. If you're talking about uh, Ignition communicating with RESTful web services specifically, um, and we're talking about uh, two items there, which would be Ignition communicating as a RESTful web client, you can do that with Ignition scripting functions. If you're talking about Ignition being a RESTful web server or uh, hosting endpoints, um, you can do that with the web dev module or the web development module that was alluded to directly inside Ignition. It, the web services module, this web Cephasoft web services module covers more than that and it also provides visual configurations. So basically it covers both RESTful clients and RESTful endpoints or RESTful um, services hosting those endpoints. Um, and it also covers SOAP-based clients and SOAP-based endpoints in a way that has a configuration that you do in a separate section inside the Ignition Designer. So you get a new entry for web services. There are configurations for those web services, and it allows for central management of those web services. Uh, to inductive automation, if you use uh, the web services module for this, or if you use Ignition for, for this for the clients and uh, you know the core scripting functions and for the uh, endpoints you use web dev to us our customers who are doing that have the same levels of success but um, the web services module um, does have a uh, higher price tag attached to it but it does have a lot more convenience in terms of the way that you can do that centralized uh, configuration if you have multiple folks working on those uh, web services endpoints uh, that can be a uh, benefit to all of it um, and uh, you know we have folks who are having success going both routes so if you're interested in learning more about that web services module uh, we, you can certainly reach out to your sales rep they can set up a quick 15 minute demo of what that looks like and um, walk you through uh, those those features that are inside that web services module uh, the second question, um, and you can actually go forward here, would be for you, Sam. The question, as it's written, do you have already existing projects that use Ignition with business data, and which type of business decisions were taken? And I think uh, if we if we back that up and make that um, uh, still just as specific, but maybe. Um, a little bit more uh, cross applicable. I think that the the interesting thing here that's being asked and the interesting thing to me is, can you give us some examples of specific business decisions that companies have made or are able to make now from different things that Grand Tech has delivered? for different uh, types of projects. Maybe you have one or two examples, and certainly not asking for any company sure. names here. Or, you know, uh, don't break any NDAs or give us any information you're not supposed to. Sure, so so one of my favorite examples of that um, is when you start expanding ignition using those MES modules um, from CEPASoft to, to really integrate your SCADA and your MES platform together. And one of the places I've seen that have the strongest effect is around supply chain planning and logistics, right? So um, with the vision of that being that you have something like your, your longer term production schedule that is being designed and uh, updated in your ERP system based on 
deals that you have with your customers and the, the rules that your supply chain team has around what it's going to take to deliver those orders. One of the things we've seen that's really interesting and been very useful is when you have more of that information present in your manufacturing environment, when you've implemented that, say, uh, the OEE or the traceability solutions that we have through the MES modules, now you are doing your detailed scheduling more within Ignition and the tools that you have there at the plant. So you're, what am I producing for this specific run for this specific shift? You can start to automatically communicate finished goods production back through that system and have that automatically update your supply chain and your planning systems so that if a major breakdown on a line is going to make it so that you're not going to hit the production numbers that are expected, it lets you take a decision not just at the plant level from how you're going to react to that, but from the supply chain level and understanding that it might make sense to reroute some of that order to a that does have excess capacity or to reprioritize orders based on business rules like uh, delivery contracts that may not necessarily be available to the people that are, are making the decisions on the plant floor. So just the ability to automatically communicate and elevate those types of decisions to the, the stakeholders who might not have had the opportunity to influence them before is definitely something that's been really powerful that we've seen implemented around closing this loop and bringing that business logic into the plan. Great. Yeah, go ahead and keep going. I think we've got a, we'll have a few more coming in here. Okay, great. So talked about some intelligence that you can add at the ignition level. Um, let's also talk about some of that processing and the information conversion that we can do outside of ignition. Actually, what a great segue I did for myself without even realizing it. So I was just talking about some of the Cephasoft MES modules and outside of Core Ignition, um, this is definitely one of the things that we see a lot of people implementing to add a little bit more intelligence to that data. So it is, um, if you're not familiar, um, Cephasoft is a, uh, develops partner modules for the Ignition platform that are all focused, um, generally focused on this manufacturing execution system or MES layer. Um, and if MES is a new term for you, the, the real idea there is that your MES is that system in your plant that can combine the OT information from automation and SCADA systems with the business logic that you all have and some of your business rules and your ERP systems to not only help you um, combine that information within the plant, but it also ends up serving as this data broker more often than not where it is truly the the governor of data between what comes into the plant and what needs to be processed outside of it so if you're going to be doing azure based machine learning over your batch processes in the cloud they still need to get that data from somewhere and your mes and SCADA systems from the plant are usually your your single point of the truth to, to drive a lot of that so Cephasoft's modules are broken up um, similarly to the ignition modules where they're kind of broken up by feature. Cephasoft has a similar strategy by MES function. So they have their features broken into OAE and downtime, track and trace, SBC and quality, and recipe and changeover modules. So um, by implementing these into your manufacturing environments, you can get a lot of intelligence along those topics um, more out of the box. These are all technically things that you could program custom and ignition if you wanted to, but in almost every case I have seen, uh, it absolutely makes sense to, to leverage the work of these modules that are, they already have it and bring some of that capability to you faster. And of course, there are other business intelligence tools that are going to be uh, important as well. One of the interesting things about smart manufacturing and digital transformation is just that exponential increase in compute power and what you can do with that compute power when you're leveraging systems in the cloud and, and large server stacks that are available out there. And again, to, to go through Ignition or uh, your MES systems to facilitate that type of transfer and help close that loop can bring you a lot of value. Which brings me to, once we have done this processing, once we have that information, the ways that Ignition can help you to deliver it. So um, I'll touch on these a little bit more quickly because I'm sure they've been, I know they've been covered in other live events that we've been working through lately, but um, the four primary things we'll talk about are vision, perspective, alarm notifications, and the reporting module. So 
vision, again, is just kind of using what a lot of you are going to have today. So uh, taking advantage of the HMI and SCADA screens that we have, integrating into those processes and making a natural information channel for people to get what they need to do their work. Um, I'll go back to a point I made a little bit earlier around proper design really influencing the usability of these screens, right? So if screens are too busy, it makes it too focus, uh, difficult for you as a user to focus on the right thing. And it can really increase the amount of training that you need to onboard new people. So having that proper design from the front is definitely the preference. But if not, don't be afraid to take the point to reevaluate things and, and make sure that you're putting your SCADA systems on the right path. And I definitely recommend taking advantage of writing standards documentation so that you can communicate expectations uh, to your vendors, as well as using Ignition's templating capabilities to help facilitate standard, clean, appealing screen designs. Speaking of appealing screen designs, that also definitely brings us over to perspective. So Ignition's HTML5-based uh, visualization platform. Um, I usually use uh, go-to perspective for, for two boxes, which is gonna be, dashboards and mashups and its mobile capabilities and especially the fact that you can do both of those designs in a single a single editor with a single design um, is it, just icing on the cake. So dashboards or mashups are kind of more of a way to get critical information out to a bunch of people quickly. These are the uh, screens that you show on a TV in a break room or a hallway or displayed in a shift kickoff meeting, but these can also be brought up on your mobile phone when you're on the go. Um, these should answer big picture questions around how you're doing and where you can improve in the short term to affect that big picture. So what do I do across a shift, a day, or a week to realize results? Um, and this actually dovetails into a question that was uh, sent a few minutes ago here. In WebSCADA, do you provide control or only monitoring the system? First of all, from an inductive automation standpoint, Ignition uh, definitely supports both. But I'm interested to know, Grand Tech, are you doing control as well? Or are you doing just monitoring? Um, the rest of this question is due to COVID-19, um, providing control as well for specific processes, reading between the lines, providing control is, is useful, I think. If providing control, how is it done as for the authority, the authorization, the authentication, as there's a risk in control systems that's inherent. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so Sam, over to you, and then um, I'll jump in afterward and answer a little bit about uh, the rest of the community and you know some of the other integrators that I work with and and what they're doing today too. Yeah. So the the question posed, oh, they they really hit the the nail on the head. Um, towards the end when they mentions uh, a risk-based approach to that. So we actually kind of approach it similarly as we would a, a safety project, right? Where it's it's really a question of thinking about the work processes that you have and, and where, how people are gonna interact with these systems, identifying the risks that might come up with that, and then determining a mitigation strategy and seeing if that's a, an acceptable risk once mitigated, right? So if you do have mobile devices on the shop floor, um, you're more likely that people are going to be down looking at their phones and not looking up at what's in front of them. You might have an added risk of having of losing devices or dropping a device into a critical machine or something like that. Um, and then, of course, with remote control, there's always this risk of someone trying to issue a control without having the knowledge of what is happening in the physical space where that control is being executed, which could be a huge safety risk if there are other people in that area, right? So, but all of those are, are mitigatable risks. Um, if you don't want people staring down at their phones all day, you can do that through policies and strict enforcements. Um, you can do certain physical designs around the mobile platforms that you pick that may influence um, the way any risk of them getting into a manufacturing equipment. You can add cameras to make sure that you have a good physical view of what's happening in a machine before any type of command would be issued. So um, it's absolutely something the platform is, is capable of doing. I think you need to ask yourselves, what is the, the risk that I'm exposing us to from a safety perspective, from a process perspective, things like that that are going to be amplified through a mobile solution. 
and balancing that with the value that you get out of it. Are you controlling this from your phone because it's a critical thing in a case like COVID, um, where is it going to provide immediate value to us? Or is it just really cool that you can start a motor from your phone? Uh, I'm willing to take more risk for the former than I am for the latter. So understanding value and risk is critical, but absolutely from a technology perspective, there are times that we've seen it and it's a good fit and we've made it work. And there are times that we've talked about the risks and benefits and said, that's not really worth it. We're gonna come up with another solution. Great, yeah, thanks for that answer. I fully agree with everything that you just said. You know, being careful about your deployment strategy is, is very important. If you are doing things in a way that you only need visualization, it's actually really easy to add web visualization to anything that you have in a plant with Ignition. Um, over MQTT, um, over, over the Gateway Network, you can just spin up another Ignition server in the cloud and connect it in a read-only fashion. We have a security hardening guide that uh, we recommend everybody follow if you are gonna spin anything up in the cloud. And then if you are going to do read-only, we have read-only service security that makes it so there's not even the possibility of someone writing back anything. So you can use access control lists with MQTT, um, or you can use the um, service security section for the gateway network and secure those things. Um, there is one other question that specifically had to do with MQTT, which is how data security is taken care of when you collect from a gateway MQTT to ignition. MQTT has, uh, it, it rides on, it has a number of security features that are built in, and then it also rides on top of HTTP, which has other security features that are built in, or on top of TCP, rather. Um, sorry, and so you can do TLS or SSL, um, and we always recommend turning that on. So turn on encryption for your MQTT traffic, and then it does have authentication, uh, so you can do username and passwords, and then MQTT has access control lists as well, ACLs, uh, so you can determine uh, what types of things you might want to do if you want to allow rights to come from different places, if you're just looking at allowing read-only access or subscribe-only access to to things that that type of thing is uh, is possible there. So um, yeah, definitely highly recommend familiarizing yourself with the security features. And we at Inductive Automation have a really strong focus on security. Uh, it's paramount for anybody inside this industry. Um, and we've really taken a, a position where we want to be the leaders in a lot of this web security and the security features and the uh, integration with technologies that folks are using today. And so um, so there's there's a lot there that you can do. Okay, great. So we don't have any other questions that have been sent. And Sam, I'll turn it back over to you to get through the rest of the items that you wanted to share. I know that you have a few more items since I have. Yeah, for sure. So what I'm going to do, everybody, I'm going to gloss over a couple of the points that I think I can do pretty quickly. If you have more questions about them, uh, email uh, Inductive or me uh, at info at grantech.com and we're happy to follow up. So um, yeah, we'll plan on going a couple of minutes over so we cover all the content and I'm going to cover some of it like the next two slides very quickly. So talking about some other delivery methods. Uh, we do have the reporting module, still very useful, especially when you need to make official records out of the system. These that are inalterable PDFs or can be made into them, so there's definitely a lot of value that you have out of the reporting module. And the alarm notification module, right? We're talking about getting the right information to the right people at the right time. What better uh, technologies do we have than being able to email and text people and have voice notifications to help issue those types of prompts? So won't cover those too much, but definitely valuable in delivering information to users. And I definitely want to spend some time talking about that use case and kind of how we can tie all of this together around a closed loop system. So just, uh, so I'll, I'll speak at a high level, but this is a, a real use case that we did develop um, with some customers that were doing some batch manufacturing process. So they were uh, did identify some critical control points for quality that they wanted to be monitoring and making sure we were, were within specific control specifications. So we used Ignition connecting via the direct drivers to collect and historize those critical control points and the quality of results that they had. On the information processing side, the goal was to use this product data to determine a proper golden batch curve 
detects deviations and then notify the users and the product teams if there was a deviation that was happening around a certain product. So one of the things that we need to do is A, know the product that we are making. Uh, this customer actually have thousands of SKUs, each with their own uh, specific golden batch curves that they wanted to hit uh, for them. So knowing what products we were making at a given time was a critical input to this process. And actually we chose an advanced analytics engine to actually do that golden batch processing and deviation detection. So we were taking this information, not doing the processing and ignition, well, we were doing some conditioning and ignition, but having the heavy lifting of that batch analysis being done in an external system. So not only did we use this to find the proper golden batch curve and profile against it, but we would use this to detect potential deviations and feed that back into ignition if one was found. So now we have our information, we have our golden batch curve, we've found an exception, um, and we need to both deliver that to our continuous improvement and product teams so that they can have a system of record and determine if there have been multiple similar deviations on a similar product over time. And no matter what, we want to feed this information back to the people that are there on the line so that they have an opportunity to address that issue prior to a major quality control happening by bringing that batch closer to the original curve. So what I like about this example is that it is not, it's a, it's, it's something I think that a lot of us understand. We, we have the idea of this golden batch profile that we are working towards. That's been something that's around in manufacturing for a long time. But this is a different way to do it in solving a more complex problem. We're not talking about a single batch curve. We're talking about thousands of batch curves. We're talking about having people with knowledge of the process picking the right one and defining that as the golden profile. And we're talking about those curves being complex enough that it was worth it to go to an offsite server to do some of that processing and, and do that analysis on those uh, systems and to have all of that then come back into the plant system for a near real time results. Um, one of the things that we've talked about sometimes um, actually hasn't come up in this conversation so far is that this is it, it's not just about closing this loop, but it's about tightening the loop too and, and that integration with other loops. So this idea of having your manufacturing process, collecting that data, driving results to it, it's an old idea that we've been doing for a long time, but we can do it with more complex information faster than we've ever been able to do it before. So again, I'll, I'll kind of quickly um, do a little bit of a rush job through these last couple slides around where you can start your smart manufacturing journey with Ignition. So the four things that I look to when uh, a new customer comes to us and wants to talk about smart manufacturing, I want to make sure that they have these four things before we really get started, especially if we're trying to talk about jumping right into an implementation. I want to make sure that you have your business goals, requirements, and success criteria clearly defined and understanding what the system needs to do to get you there. I want to see the financial justifications, understand any expectations around payback on the investment. Um, we want the right level of sponsorship for this too, right? If we're talking about a large enterprise-wide global initiative, we shouldn't have a sponsor that is an individual plant manager as the primary sponsor for a project. So making sure that you have the right people backing up your ambitions is absolutely something that helps drive success throughout the organization. And finding the right vendors, whether that be consultants or integrators or finding the right software and hardware, um, we need to know, make sure that we know the playing field that we're playing on if we're gonna play the game. And you know, Grand Tech uh, does a lot of ignition implementations. Um, we do have to look at a bunch of other platforms, though, too, as we're a systems integrator, and we, we do implement many platforms. The things that I see when I'm talking to customers that indicate that ignition is a good choice, though, or the things that are particularly appealing for them are generally that it's a platform solution, which I really like. Um, it's not a conglomeration of a bunch of different programs that have been acquired over a number of years to eventually solve the problem. It's a single platform. It's a single space that you are doing, uh, which you can expand through third party modules, but really there's so much you can do within the environment and that simplifies the process and the training and the long-term support of the solution. Um, we also like how flexible the platform is. We have, I can't think of very many instances where we run into something that Ignition can't do. Uh, it's very customizable and workable to those customer requirements. But I do say that with the word of warning, 
not to over customize too early and to focus on things that are out of the box that can fit your uh, requirements and to know what's in the box so that you know when to take something out of it, right? Um, what I mentioned earlier, for example, with the Cephasoft OEE and MES modules, we have seen people write their own custom solutions uh, to address those types of issues. But when they've realized that there was a module that also fit a lot of their criteria, we've realized they could have saved a lot of time had they known that. And then finally, of course, the, the licensing model, this unlimited style of uh, licensing is um, unique, especially in the, the MES and smart manufacturing space. The a la carte modules are always uh, helpful to find out exactly what you need. The price overall is very competitive, um, and there's a lot of flexibility around your architectures and your hardware deployment options. In general, when people come to me and want to know how to get started with smart manufacturing, I find them to generally be within three buckets. If you are just starting to explore start ma smart manufacturing, I recommend that you focus more on researching and identifying those business case, the, the business case that you have and your requirements. At some point, you're going to need to show somebody why your investment is going to pay back and make the company all sorts of money. So making sure that you're focusing on that business case from the get-go can really drive a lot of your decisions and make sure that you're getting the paybacks that you expected to justify the project in the first place. If you're actively exploring smart manufacturing and looking for the right tools, why not just try Ignition? That barrier to entry is so low, you can get some trial versions of the software and start to see how it might fit those requirements that you've established. And then finally, if you already have Ignition, but you want to start leveraging it for more of the smart manufacturing initiatives that you have, um, take a look at your use cases and applications today. Go and find out what's in that module marketplace and find the right tools to support you and your team. So before we take it to final questions, I mentioned a little bit of this earlier, but I do want to mention quickly that, uh, again, I am here from Grand Tech. Uh, we are def uh, a, we pride ourselves in our ignition certifications and partnership. We are an enterprise integrator. We are a SCADA premier integrator, and we are qualified and certified in all of the Cephasoft MES modules as well. Um, we do both. Again, we, we focus on the automation side of things as well as the smart manufacturing um, digital transformation aspect as well. And we're happy to help anybody through that journey as they need to. And with that, um, I'll kind of hand it back over to Kevin in case there are other final questions that have come up or uh, if there's anything else that you want to do to close out the session for that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Sam, I wanted to say uh, thank you, thank you from Inductive Automation, from myself for being here, for sharing. Grand Tech is a great company. If you need to engage an integrator, um, certainly talk to them. If you are an integrator and you just want to say hi to Sam, and we are going to have continuing Ignition Community Lives. Uh, make sure that you are on our newsletters. We send them out on a regular basis. So we have our weekly newsletter that goes out. And and uh, all right, with that, I think we're going to be concluded. So uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next week. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye.